Bernie, what can science do to help cities become more sustainable? Well, there are things that are fairly obvious and absolutely necessary. As an example, um, basic chemistry. There are chemi chemical types uh, of plastics, for instance, uh, thermosets that are used broadly in the industry. They're not recyclable for all intents and purposes. And the problem with that, obviously, is there are current estimates that very shortly there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. That's not acceptable. So there we actually, one of the chemists who worked for us, in fact, reinvented the chemistry of thermosets to enable you to break them all the way down to their monomer and then reuse them, which renders them completely recyclable. So that sort of thing is what a scientist has to pursue because frankly, having plastics out there that are clogging up the oceans and killing fish, it's not acceptable. So that's one sort of obvious thing. And there are many other fairly straightforward things in terms of just aiding, for instance, in pursuing as an example um, crop modification through techniques uh, like CRISPR-Cas where you might be able to get 30% more yield out of a rice crop which avoids starvation in regions that otherwise are short, for instance, of water if you make that rice less water intensive through modifying it. However, there were also things which are a little more challenging and a lot deeper. Fundamentally, if you think about the emergence of AI and machine learning, it is an incredible force for good. I mean, if you think about where it's being used as an example, we use it in oncology where you can study literally 3,500 textbooks, a quarter of a million papers, and you can do that in 15 seconds and connect it back to a treatment plan for a patient that otherwise might have died. I mean, this is the obvious and wonderful side of it. The flip side of it is society is enormously dependent upon levels of automation and integration today that are unprecedented and beyond human abilities to handle. So it's all being handled in an automated fashion. The trouble with that level of automation is no different than a bank that suffers a denial of service attack you could have, literally, your city have a denial of service attack, or even worse, an outright hack. I mean, some of them, you know, people just want to be comedians and they'll make the sewage pumps run backwards. This is, you know, fairly destructive and disgusting, but it's not the thing you worry about. What you really worry about is somebody, for instance, decides to just take down the electrical grid, or even worse, eh, yeah, we've got a 120 volt grid, let's see what happens if we run it at 480 volts. Yeah, this could be a problem. Um, those kinds of outcomes would be fairly catastrophic. And the fact of the matter is, scientists who are working with AI and machine learning, it is time to actually start integrating those capabilities as defensive capabilities in things like security operations centers and such. This is a very advanced topic, frankly, because it requires you to recognize good and bad behavior on the part of systems, on the part of the underlying software, on the part of incoming code. So these are areas that basically are emergent. They are actually have they have started now, that's why they're emergent, but they have a ways to go. So these are areas which would be very helpful to be able to execute. So I'm concerned about how much energy, what the carbon footprint is, when we t design and build tall buildings. And I think it would be really useful if um, scientists could properly analyse how much carbon goes into constructing, say, a 50-storey building versus a 25-storey building in terms of the amount of energy that's needed to build it so it can resist wind loads in the same location, uh, take into account the floor plate that's needed for the lifts and elevators and um, the amount of energy that's needed to lift up people and water and other supplies to make the building function over its lifetime. If we really could find out where is the tipping point for what is a sustainable tall building, that would be brilliant. Well, one thing that scientists should do is inform the public and also city planners, policy makers about waste not being a waste unless you throw it away. So what we want to do is to get people to sort their waste and recover usable materials and resources out of the waste that new science and technology can reuse and take advantage of the waste. It is very important for scientists to collect data and for the and then convey their findings to somebody who works for the government or somebody who can do, interpret it, analyze it and then convert it to policy so that it can then be implemented. All data, scientific data, can be used but you need somebody who can able to um, effectively translate that results from scientific data to policy and to implementation.
Well, that's a very big question, but um, from my perspective, I think there are lots of things scientists actually can do um, to help cities to shift towards a bit more sustainable end. And very often when you talk about cities, people think about um, urban planners and um, those sort of practitioners. And not very often science actually comes into the picture, but actually science has a you know, lots of role to play in this. For example, like some of many of the decision making, um, you know, practitioner or, or um, urban decision making, are very often based on a single variable sort of um, relationships and say, okay, as far as we optimize this particular thing, then we're done. But actually, cities are much, much more complex than one thing. And as an example, for example, you know, having a high density um, suburb, high density cities, it's a wonderful thing. But then you really have to look at what are the trade-offs you're making and what are the benefits you actually can seek out. So shouldn't really go, you know, for high density for the sake of density, but really um, try to understand the cities as a complex system, human dominant complex system, and then try to manage it as such, rather than you know manage it as as something that is really simple, a machinery kind of thing that you can simply optimize it with, with, you know, based on relationship of one, you know, single variable. So my message would be really, you know, view cities as a complex system and then, you know, adopt a systems approach towards understanding um, the many different um, patterns, processes and interlinkages that are happening within cities and also, you know, use that kind of um, principle in managing um, cities. Look, I think scientists can work hand in glove with policy makers, so getting together with, with the, the mayor, the deputy mayor, with uh, officers at these cities, asking what questions they need answers to, and then actually co-designing that research. So I think that's where the greatest benefit can be realised. When that research is co-designed, you're going to get outcomes that the city needs, answers that the city needs, and you're going to get research that's implemented. Can you tell us uh, what co-design means to you and maybe have an example? Sure, look, co-design can mean a range of things. It can literally mean co-funding a professorial chair in resilience like we have done with the University of Melbourne. So we equally part fund that, that chair. We get to have a say in, in the research topics and questions and direction. Equally, we hand over our data to, to that position. So um, that's the example of, of really joined up between the university sector and also ourselves at the City of Melbourne. So there are a whole host of ways which we can we can really co-design those research questions from pretty light touch stuff like you know, university saying, well, what are you guys interested in at the moment? Getting down, down the road to City Hall and vice versa. It's a really joined up with like funding a chair in resilient cities.